any of those last season, but looking good there for that game. We are, of course, into the picks and bands here. Azir banned out for QG as their first. I would say that Cool was insanely polarizing last season. There were plenty of games where he solo carried. When the Assassins were in meta, his LeBlanc and Ari was out of this world, but he had equal games where we remember his 0-7-Z game and games like that where just he got nothing going, just had no way to get back into a game. He either went off or he was very well kept in check. And it's been pretty much the story this weekend as well. Two Azir games, one big carry game, another game that was a bit questionable. Azir banned away here, and we just wait to see whether Siva will finally join the picks and bands. We'll have to see here. She'll definitely join the picks if she's available, True. but Rek'Sai banned there for OMG away from Swift. Like that choice a lot. Callista banned there by the OMG, so respecting its power on the red side. Alistar, interestingly, banned away by QG, and they played it last time, so respecting its power as well. And another ban here for QG gonna come through. Whenever a team picks a champion on the purple side, then bans it on blue. It's all about the fact that they have first pick and they know they'll surrender two strong champions. So clearly they don't want to surrender Alistair, but don't really recognize it as a powerful enough champion as a first pick. Yep, so Gragas ban there as well. Another strong, popular first pick champion in OMG. One ban left. That's two junglers taken away. A mid laner there as well. Maybe they have to consider Cassiopeia with his ear ban, but we'll have to see. I'm waiting to see what the final ban is. A lot of discussion between the coaching staff and Jiang as, as to who should be the final ban in this champion pick. Six seconds left, they go with Nidalee. Interesting. Almost a placeholder ban. Of course, Swift does play jungle Nidalee. It is a carry jungler, but I don't feel like it necessarily needs to be on the ban list. I mean, I think with the Rek'Sai ban, they were just like, well, we'd rather throw another ban at your jungler because he's so good, but I agree. It's a bit of a weird one for OMG. Makes some sense given how strong Swift was in that game, but QG, they've got to consider their first pick here. I wonder if they were considering Nidalee because this is taking quite a while and Maokai makes a lot of sense if that's what they want. Maokai being available is definitely Xiang's most impressive performing champion has been Maokai. Maokai doesn't have too many special mechanics to talk about. Only really the twisted events can be an impressive spell. So it's a very reliable champion. You can always go into the Hecker and Mona for a skill matchup to some degree, but it's locked in. It's very reliable. Xiang trying to do a Koro, at least mousing over the, the teleport smite Mundo, which has been sitting competitive play by Koro, as I mentioned at MSI. But that Civ is available. Yeah, Civ is available. Hecarim's available as well if Xiang plays it. I don't know if Xiang plays Rumble. That would be maybe the one worry for QG, but probably not too fussed about it, to be perfectly honest, as OMG going to hover some strong champions for themselves there. But we'll give them a couple more seconds. Never mind. Civ is locked in, and LeBlanc joins her. And we talked yesterday about the fact that we didn't expect... Uh, LeBlanc to be a respect ban against many mid laners. Cool is definitely one of them that does command a lot of assassin bans. LeBlanc by far the strongest in this current meta. So probably going to see the LeBlanc pick. It opens up either Lulu or Morgana, which has definitely been the champions that Doinby has been the most comfortable on, is the more defensive options, because given that he's already played two Morgana games, he does commit to the Lulu. Lulu Evelyn's already a combination we saw from EDG yesterday. Switch probably going to take something with pressure. What's his decision going to be? We'll have to find out. Lulu is the pick away, and Evelyn... Going to be instant pressure, but implied pressure, certainly. I like the pick up here for Swift because that's what they've gone for. I would say it's instant pressure just because from the moment you load into the game, you're really playing I around got things. Tricked. Wow, I believe that was a zero second timer that just that was. warped into a so Sejuani. So that's completely different. I mean, Eve morphing into Sejuani, not something I thought we'd see. There's Hecarim Nautilus as we catch up a tad here. But yeah, I mean, Sejuani, a very different champion for Swift. Not that aggressive at all. Well, then you'd have to say that the pick and ban strategy from OMG has come together because they banned two high-pressure junglers that are in meta and forced Swift now onto a more passive jungler. Of course, you can make ganks work as Sejuani, but so, so much harder. And now suddenly, the risk of playing a champion like Hecarim is that much lower because it's not a wreck side. There's not a ganking jungler available to punish a weaker laner like Hecarim. TNT locks in vain. Morgana's going to join her as the support, you have to think. Maybe. Could, yeah, could still be a mid laner for Doinby, so they have some options here. Maybe Dormy prefers the Morgana into the Blanc matchup. They're both fairly similar. He's going to be safe no matter what here. But Vayne, as we've said, Vayne and Tessiv are always tricky, especially against a player the likes of Uzi. The only person that has pulled it off so far this weekend was Kid on day one against World Elite, was able to undo Mystic Siva with the Vayne. So given the win rate, maybe the fact that it's been participated in one of the two victories makes it a viable choice. They're left with a jungle choice, actually, at last pick. So... Definitely not been about hiding picks. It's been taking what's powerful and dealing with the results. 
Nunu will be the last pick. He's got strong lanes. He's got a strong mid lane to deal with. So definitely going to need pressure from Cool to get any sort of counter jungling going on. And it's not the Evelyn matchup that we talked about being a decent matchup for Eve. It's definitely the invading early game jungle against the late game powerhouse in Sejuani. Yeah, I think smart stuff though for OMG as a last pick as far as junglers go. Pretty low pressure in most of QJ's lanes, which is weird given how much pressure they had in the last game. So I think Shui is going to feel pretty comfortable trying to keep tabs on Sejuani because really Swift had such a good game and a high impact champion like Sejuani you just want to keep him down for as long as possible and Rek'Sai definitely has so many more twos than Sejuani even though both of them have dashes that can go over terrain you're still probably not going to have the same early game impact but going through the lanes Maokai versus Hecarim definitely outscale options for Hecarim but Maokai oh so strong in the mid game always good there is Swift on Sejuani this time versus the Nunu there of Shui Shui and Doinbi gonna go back to the more defensive mid laners up against Cools LeBlanc it's where he's looked strongest has been on the likes of Morgana on the wave because he's been very adept at not dying in lane which is very useful against an assassin like LeBlanc TNT caution to the wind we saw it this tried against Death's Sivir yesterday. Now against Uzi's Sivir, we see the vein. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who's is better, actually. They're both very good Sivir players. But I think, you know, TNT used to play with Uzi. It's a, a definitely a bit risky, we'll say. But we'll have to see if it works. It'll look like a genius if it does. It's definitely a bit of feels between the two players. Not necessarily friends or enemies, but just because you're past compatriots, colleagues, you have to say. Taking Uzi out on Vayne would be just juicy. It would be. But Uzi does not take these sort of things lightly. Let's see how the matchup goes. And we're on to the rear for our second game between QG and OMG. Oh my god, currently find themselves up a game here against the young new team. And QG, after all their success on Friday, hoping to not get 0 2 or 2 0 in this situation. Chao Go going for a very aggressive invade. Already spotted out, they would see it that the ward has been matched to OMG. So they're aware that there is a couple of members of QG on the top. So maybe don't know about the five man stack. QG going to invade another area. Nunu's watching out, going to find plenty of enemies. And unsurprisingly, whenever we see a vein, what's the first thing that pops into our head? Say it with me. It's lane, lane swap. swap. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's always going to be the consideration. But they're ready for a lane swap. They've already got the teleport smite advantage. So what that gives the Hecarim is that in a lane swap, whenever the freeze comes through, just leave lane and go and pick up camps. And it also means that Uzi can start pushing, force the lane swap to end. And by the time that all happens, and Vayne will not be able to equalize a push and, and take a turret with anywhere the same impetus that Uzi can on the Sivir. By the time that's matched, Hecarim comes out, got a few jungle items, and basically is flexible to do whatever he wants. And I think that's the big reason why Vayne just isn't that effective in the matchup. She doesn't fit that many comps. Theoretically good against tanks, but very hard to pull off as far as execution goes because you're so fiercely single target. And you know what? They don't even need it at this point because OMG kind of take a guess and they're actually going to get the 2v2. I'm going to say that in this particular comp, it's better than some of the previous veins we've seen. So, for example, the last time we saw a free farm vein, it was vein against an Azir. And the big thing about Azir is that vein can't tumble to avoid that Azir damage. There's so much AoE happening between the multiple sand soldiers that one tick will be enough to take her down. In this game, if you manage to avoid the tethers or avoid LeBlanc, and that's easier said than done, obviously, there's less AoE damage. So you only really have to respect the threat. You have to hope for your tank line to really keep LeBlanc in check and then respect the threat of the Hecarim. Do those two things, and there is that slight potential of Vayne going off in a fight. That's true. Here is Shui Shui going to clear out his first camp here. It is the Wolf camp. He'll take it out as Doinby taking a bit of early damage there from Cool, and with both side and Crystalline Floss, they can afford to trade blows back and forth, but standard Lance, he just flipped upside down, and Uzi, you could see already, hits level two and zones uh, TNT completely off the wave. Okay, but at least... Plenty of respect coming through from QG there. Happy to seed lane advantage. I think this is a matchup where there's no ambiguity about it. You know that when level two is hit, there's nothing you can do as QG against Sivir and uh, against Sivir and North, especially with so many different options. Swift joins the lane very, very early, and they get a good chunk of damage yep. onto Xian. I like that a lot. Has the red buff. Lots of good CC, actually, even at level two, especially if you land the Arctic Assault, Xiang. Uh, Especially without an escape summoner and maybe without devastating charge. We've seen a lot of smart Hecarim ganks early Kakao. I think on Friday was doing it from IG as cool. Does that game for a bit of poke damage, but again, just really wants to pressure the Lulu. 
from the Sejuani. No interest at all in picking up a second buff. Might actually be three buff by the Nunu. Already walked over casually to steal away the QG blue buff. Going to be hard for Sejuani to invade onto red. Being ever-present and being spotted by, out by a pink might lead to a casual three buff by Nunu. And Swift again going to pay for a bit of bit of aggression here. His aggression in the early stages of game one was fantastic, but he's lost so much already. In fact, Shui Shui is lucky not to take the grunt there as well. Though he's actually got bound as well. Great condemn coming through from TNT. Swift gonna follow in there. Uzi gonna try and find it. Swift does come through. Teleport as well. They're moving in. The Black Shield is enough and Swift claims first blood. Now V finds his way onto Amazing. Glitter Lance here from Doinby as well, who's also joined in and everyone joined in on the top lane, but it's Swift that gets first blood. And if they hadn't have had to use the teleport it would have been complete success as the result comes out. Hecarim's able to push in the wave, so V loses a bit from this. But that's one way to pick up your blue buff, and that's to kill the Nunu and reclaim it back. And I thought Twehue had such good early pathing there, but a little too much on the grump. A great rotation there by the Vayne Morgana as well. And I guess that's one of the weird things. You don't usually expect two people in your top lane. That's, I mean, that's something that Nunu understood. He was just too aggressive. Take the blue and get out. Gromp really giving your life up for the Gromp is not a worth trade if you're Nunu. He didn't have to do it, and he paid for his over-aggression. He did indeed. Is Uzi going to clear out the waves with some ricochet here? Amazing going to come through as well to help him out. And little low on mana here is Uzi. In fact, Vayne's kept reasonably competitive in this lane. The assist will help out there as well. Looks like TNT might be backing off here because it's just a bit too much aggression coming through, but goes back and gets an early vamp. So after things starting to look up for Vayne. Pushed out the as much as a Vayne can against Sivir, but it's just, you know, nothing much you can really do. Morgana's putting down the puddle off cooldown to try and keep it away, but going to be easily pushed under turret. There's no way you can control a wave against Vayne, and that's why it's, it's Vayne against Sivir, and that's why it's such a good lane for Sivir. And you can see all that CS means Uzi now with a 38 to 23 CS advantage as he goes back for his first shop and gets a pickaxe now. So going to continue applying pressure and pretty slim gold lead so far, but it's just the back timings that have really benefited OMG's dual lane. And it's also benefited Jiang, of course, has had his teleport, just used it to get back to lane quicker, and now Maokai double Dorans, but behind in CS, of course, has a much lower item's uh, flaw when it comes to being relevant, just wants to really work towards that righteous glory. So him being behind in CS maybe not be a big problem on paper, but there is the outscale potential coming through from Jiang, who's been able to get more CS than expected in a 1v1 lane matchup against Maokai, and Swift is going to try and make something out of what is growing to be a poor situation for QG. And Swift continuing that aggression. Look wonderful on the Rex side. I like that he's doing it on Sejuani. It's not, you know, the most expected thing. It's amazing. It's a binding TNT. Going to get good trade damage down. Doesn't commit to the last Silver Vault proc, though, because Uzi always threatening on the Silver. It's the Vamp Scepter. So Nunu, again, going for a very aggressive move. I believe Swift doesn't know, but very much suspects the Dragon's being started. So watch it out. No opportunity to pick up a Dragon Advantage for OMG. Yeah, realizes he's on top of a pink ward there as well. Starts auto-attacking it. Maybe a one hit or two too late, but probably wouldn't have got it anyway, but does at least stop the Dragon attempt. A lot of CS coming through from Zhang. Has 48, has the highest in the game on Hecarim. That's usually a bad sign if you're QG. It has to be a bad sign here. We've seen what happens to especially short-range carries like Vayne, like Callista, when Hecarim can get going here. So Uzi... Gonna try to do what he can. Good dodge actually there and a great boomerang blades to pressure. This is the one thing I love seeing the good Sivir players do is push in aggressively with Ricochet and then just constantly poke and just cut off options and harass them under tower with your Q. And even with more reposition opportunities, TNT is the one that's eating every skill shot and Uzi's skillfully dodging them so their health bars. Vamp Scepter's 10% lifesteal but it's not that much. It's what, at the moment, it's 9 health on hit and Siva with the pickaxe just has all the options in top. Yeah, Shoichu is here as well but realizes there's not too many gain options, so we'll give it up. Maybe eats a binding there actually and gets his recall cancelled but it's a subtle thing but Uzi's making really good use of terrain. Every time someone hugs a wall he throws a Q out and it's like, well, where am I going to go now? It's a cool notice there when the area, speaking of getting Yeah, noticed. TNT, more terrain going to be problems there. Uzi going to get a kill 2v2 in the lane. It's just 2v2 kill. No jungle involvement required whatsoever. The pickaxe damage registering. TNT dies, and this Sivir matchup not going great. LeBlanc with a long roam. Yeah, Xiong actually going to take the tower up now as well. Good dodge there as Cool does get the chain down, but it's not enough damage. Xiong used the ulti. Cool was there, but he couldn't quite get in range. And Q V dodged 
almost all the damage coming through. So even without Flash, lives quite comfortably. Still backs away, doesn't have Teleport to get back to lane. Didn't want to see the reverse pressure and didn't want to stay in lane low health because that probably would have granted OMG enough pressure to take Dragon. And they're going to get the blue buff instead. Yes, do get it there. It's cool. We'll take it away from himself. Continuing to cause pressure. Gets them off the Dragon and Uzi might be able to get the turret, get back shop and then get back to the bottom lane for the Dragon. Meanwhile at Siva has very much been the sentiment multiple times this weekend, you give her free time with a turret, pickaxe, BF sword, both on either. She does so much damage to structures. V will try and stop her, and look, might be successful. Teleport there from Xiong, gonna actually protect Uzi. Surprised they didn't commit for the turret there as well, because they actually do lose out a bit, but I guess Xiong probably knows he's in this lane anyway, why not just teleport? <laughs> Some of the teleports coming through from Xiong have been pretty questionable. He didn't need to teleport onto a minion now, of course, has a longer teleport timer. In fact, QG might actually get dragon control now that they have basically five minutes of time and space to get this dragon. Quite possibly. I mean, Uzi is swapping back down, so that's good. At least Xiong probably able to get the turret relatively swiftly, but I agree. Xiong, obviously new to the role, maybe going to adjust those teleport timings just a tad. Teleport is one of the most nebulous things. It was only a year or so after competitive play had monopolized teleport that solo queue started to include teleport. So even through scrims, Getting teleport, the good teleport players and the bad teleport players haven't really changed. The likes of Acorn are still masters of the teleport, Koro as well, and other players have struggled to really find the best use. It requires so much communication, looking at the map rather than the solo mechanics that used to be the trademark and the calling card of top lane. Turret finally does fall in top lane though, and the gold lead starts to be amassed by OMG. Yeah, cool getting harassed down, but keeping competitive in CS there. Blue buff as well. I mean, he'll just clear out the wave as best he can. Xiong though, 20 CS ahead of the Maokai Siva. Massively far ahead, about 35 CS ahead there of TNT's van. And we said, don't make the Uzi angry and play van into Siva, but TNT's feeling the wrath now. And look, it's only the late, late, late game that QG can really look to fight for at this point. Swift's behind Nunu, although it's pretty competitive between the two. Maokai, he's relevant, but doesn't have any friends or damage dealers to really prompt fighting over. You usually want early power spikes in at least one of your other two lanes in terms of damage to combine with Maokai's bevy of CC and decent base damages. But Vayne is not going to be relevant in these fights. Still sticking with the lane swap. I'm surprised OMG haven't punished them by attempting to take a dragon. Maybe it's going to come soon, but they've been very objective focused on just the turrets. I think after the tower might be a thing, but yeah, we're starting to see a lot more civil rotations as well. It was Corky at the start of the last season we noted from EDG, but they've even switched to Siva doing the same thing in OMG following suit quite nicely. It doesn't give you quite the same hybrid damage, so maybe shuts down some of your AD assassin choices in mid, but Zed has definitely started to go out the door. When 5.9 comes through and the one second a lockout on the R means that you can't go for those insane juke plays and you become a bit more linear and your options are Zed. Feels like Corky, just a bridge too far, it has scaling into the late game against Cinder Hulk champions especially, has always been noted as one of his weak points, and Siva really fulfills the much the same role. Yeah, just a good replacement here, and as you said, definitely fits the meta with the ulti, as Doinby going to get aggressed on by Amazing, but that's the ulti from Siva. Cool, pops back into the lane, and everybody backs away sheepishly. Look, they but they force out the teleport. Now they're actually going to be the team to have the teleport advantage after Jiang's reckless teleport in the top lane. They're going to be at least 40 seconds ahead when it comes to the teleport markers because of course V went for the defensive teleport to a structure rather than the very aggressive teleport onto a minion coming through from Xiang. Haven't really called any action in the mid lane because LeBlanc has found the absolutely the biggest wet noodle to hit and that's a, a AP Lulu in the mid. Yeah, Lulu. Not bad in the matchup, can definitely poke you out. Part of the reason why Cool started Flask going a bit more defensive with the Athenes. Actually, both of them going to opt for the same build. But yeah, Lulu definitely neutralized a lot of mid lane matchups. So Cool trying to remember, hasn't quite found it yet. Well, the highest kill pressure mid laner against the most defensive mid laner gives you the result you'd expect. Yeah, TNT though, good black wow. shield there. I'm going to come back in Swift, hiding in the brush and gets himself a kill. That was definitely an Occam's Razor situation. That time Swift was there, he was camping at just the perfect time. Unfortunately, takes the kill credit away, but hyper carry to some degree is Sejuani doing so much damage with that health scaling. Already has the Cinder Hulk, which means this giant spell will really be boosting both the damage and tankiness of Sejuani. You'd prefer it on a Vayne who's behind, but still, Swift gets going. We've certainly seen this from EDG before. It's safe to say that Swift is the other carry in this team comp, and maybe just for the team with the way he's been playing here. It's early days definitely for QG, so can't quite confirm that yet, but... 
Uzi rocking definitely the primary carry mode, at least this time on the team. And the Avarice Blade is back again. Avarice Blade Sivir. That seems to be the standard build. But honestly, when you're so far ahead of your opponent who still only has the constituent parts of a Blade of Their Own King, just make your advantage bigger. It's one of the reasons why when the GP10 meta was back in vogue, it was a race to get the most GP10. So you were rushing to get implied extra gold as you scaled on into the game. It's only the single GP10 now, but it just means that the advantage will be kept by Siva and cultivated and only get bigger. I think it's not even just a snowball thing as Doinby is going to get missed there by the Chen Chiang. Those down in no ulti to chase in has used the smite already, but will dive in. Doinby, though, keeps himself safe for the wild growth, but the tower in bottom goes down swift. Could be in trouble. Uzi's popped his ulti. They're going to try and kill the Sejuani. Huawei needs to line something up. Good ulti there for Amazing Swift. Will go down. Massive Nunu ulti there as well. Maybe a bit too much turret damage. That's a flash away from Nunu. Uzi going to dive in. He really wants it, but maybe that's a little too much. Uzi going to try and find the last few hits and does get it. Yeah, V he does fall. They were pressuring in mid, pressuring in bottom. Vayne free farming at the same time. But the game's being played around Vayne as if she's Nasus. And the game might be over before Vayne is a relevant threat in fights. Yep, that's a tier 2 turret in the bottom lane down as well. Uzi going to claim even more turrets. 3 to 1 now for his team. 3,000 gold ahead for OMG and everything is looking good. Vayne, unfortunately, she has this other situation. Because she's so fiercely single target, you feel baited in saying, okay, she'll carry us in the late game, have her split push, she'll pick up a turret. But in the meantime, because she's not even very good at taking structures, you can do so much work and ensure that if she's competitive or underfarmed in a fight, she'll die to one of the assassins or the ways that OMG have to deal with her. And it's just the risk reward of running Vayne just doesn't seem to be there still. Maybe a couple of balance changes, maybe a meta change will prompt hyper carries like Vayne to come back into the meta. But if you're not going to play Jinx, you certainly shouldn't be playing Vayne. I mean, I can see the attraction. Blade of the Ruin King got changed slightly. Seems good against all these Cinderhawk champions, but yeah, theory and practice don't quite weigh the same there. And on the other side, Sivir, been amazing all weekend. We keep talking about it. And as I wanted to mention with the Avarice Blade, I think Siv has done so much winning that it's hard to say it's not a snowball choice, but I can see the theory of, I have my AD item, I'm already fairly effective, I just want to be pushing waves down anyway. If I'm going to be hoovering up minion waves left, right, and center, why not have an Avarice Blade in that situation? I mean, the obvious answer is the same reason why you don't see Yasuo as pick up an early Avarice Blade. It doesn't give you a lot of combat sets, so it pigeonholes into you into wave control options. Down bottom, though, more fighting. Yeah, Nunu in trouble. There actually is going to go down. Vayne getting a much-needed kill does take it away. Jiang, though, ulting around the side there. Cool. Carning around Swift is very tanky. Uzi's forced to flash away. Now the rest of OMG going to look to go down. That's a second there for TNT. Maybe make it three for three. Does indeed. Deed and vain, much needed gold acquired. And suddenly you feel vindicated for Sejuani having that extra health. Then the wild growth as well, also interacting with the Northern Wind's damage. It just lived forever. There was nothing the OMG lineup could do. Looked like Uzi wasn't in position to fight, was actually in the mid lane. And that's a lot of kills coming through for. QG to try and get their comp rolling, and who better to pick them up but Vayne? Yeah, Vayne desperately needed gold, just got a bunch there despite being 30 odd CS behind. Gets a turret kill there as well as a result. Let's so see a replay. TNT, yes, yeah, sick replay there for the Vayne, but that's extra gold for the whole team, and TNT, Blade of the Ruin King's done, and he explodes. Yeah, he had, he's had the Blade of the Ruin King during that fight. We'll go back with most of a Phantom Dancer if that's what he's looking to pick up. At least going to be the Berserker Greaves. Yep, Berserker Greaves zeal. So a lot of immediate power suddenly going to be hitting that much harder because probably going to be mostly Silver Bolts. There's going to be the important statistic in a fight. Randowans is the snowball choice coming through from Swift. A super early Randowans. Sejuani's sitting on top of Sivir. If the Ricochets aren't a factor because she's being separated from the other members of QG and the Randowans becoming in that early, maybe Sejuani can do the solo job of shutting down Uzi. I mean, we talked about it. It's Swift and... Uh, TNT here, there are the carries in this particular team comp. So Swift, he's getting tankier, Vayne's getting more damage. That last little fight, very well positioned by QG. And no, no, that's a bit too aggressive on the dra on the dragon there, yeah, mate. has definitely been trying to chump up. Whatever he can find, he's died to a Gromp. He's forced to fight around dragon. He definitely pushes too far in. TNT's getting a lot of turret damage. That's more than you'd expect, given the comp. And Cool does not have enough damage yet to threaten this Vang, which is the unfortunate thing. There's even decent peer with the Morgana and the Lulu as well. So TNT, understandably, feels pretty powerful at this stage. And Cool, he's almost never 
uh, takes this line of build, but it's gone a fiends into what I have to. It's going to be Murtez. It might even be Abyssal Scepter, but a very de defensive build means he doesn't have much kill pressure, like you mentioned. We can see now. Q going to land in there. Cool. Dive in to clear out the wave. Uzi has just been sitting here for most of the time, but that dragon's going to go to QG as a result. Oh, do you want the mid lane turret? And they're not even going to get that with Doinby just sitting there on wave clear duty. Jung's probably the big unknown variable, though, Pastry Time. He's the person that's won the most from all the early trades, even though he's zero. 0 2 and 0 has a lot of CS, only second to Sivir on his team. He's going to be piling on the items. It's only the Cinder Hulk and the Boots 2 so far, but Home Guard is two out of three pieces of what is the three piece pie with Trinity Feast. Trinity Force. I almost said three piece feast, but okay. <laughs> Well, keep the food off the mind for now. He needs to finally get that item to be a threat, but it's a bit worrying. He's putting a lot of eggs in the basket of Jiang on Hecarim. Again, new to the role, a champion that really has to be precise in a team fight. They're going to trust Swift to answer Uzi. Jiang is going to be the person that needs to get onto TNT. Yeah, and OMG. I mean, Cool can do it when he gets some items, but that's a bit way off. Yes, yeah, Swift, oh. massive ulti there comes in, and Uzi goes back in, but TNT is going to dive through. Does get knocked up, and Xiong's going to try and make it happen. Does get Morgana. TNT diving in aggressive. They want Uzi so bad. They are going to get him. Vayne picks it up. Shui Shui is going to go down as well. Amazing might even follow. And QG on the back of Swift pick. Go three for two. You need to be so careful when playing. Playing around the Hecker and went to dive the vein after so much damage had come down. TNT just flashed and tumbled past him. No more CC in the kit coming through from Hecarim. No burst, burst damage onto TNT. Sivir dies. And Swift is making this game happen off his own back, doing his best clear love impression. And it's been super successful in the last two engages. It has been. He is trying so hard to give TNT the dream of beating Uzi Sivir on Vayne, which, let me tell you, that man may smile a lot when he wins, but it's the opposite when he loses. 5-1-2, and two, and that's not been about... TNT's play, that's been about his team really setting him up to succeed, the triple kill before. If that hadn't come through, if they hadn't made those mistakes in bottom and donated triple kill, that team fight could never have happened, but the extra burst in power, now we're going to be perilously close to the Phantom Dancer. Uzi's going to say, well, I did so much work in lane shutting him down, and yet he's still going to show up with more kills than I have. Yeah, now he's got that static shift dagger there as well, looking for Berserker Greaves. So Last Whisper, if that's his next item, is a far way away in vain, is powering up quickly. Phantom Nets have just completed. There's an extra longsword there as well. And all of a sudden, Uzi and TNT feel very close in gold. Yeah, that's the, that's the worrying part is that should never be the case. That's one of the reasons why Civ is such a great matchup is that she has so many more options. She should either push down the turret, freeze in, poke out, has poke advantage. The only thing that... Uh, Vayne has the advantage of is a Blade of the Ruin King all in that should be so much later in the lane because Blade of the Ruin King should be slower given how hard it is to navigate lane. So when you're even with Vayne against a Sivir, then suddenly your options are pretty damn good. Yeah, and we can see this is the dueling items really that Vayne's love to build. It's the classic Va uh, imp build, honestly, that we actually saw him play in the last season. Lots of mobility, good dueling potential, oh, and amazing. Going to get shredded here. TCT does not quite finish that ultimate, but QB not stopping there as Cool dives in. Way too aggressive. TNT, another kill. Swift finds the ulti. That's a condemn to the wall for a second kill. And TNT is being gifted so many kills. You give Swift to Sejuani. You don't lose a lot of gang pressure because, man, he was doing his best levels four and five. And he is pinned pinpoint accurate they didn't even need the glacial prison to take down uh, uh to take down LeBlanc. They actually killed him during the wild growth and then had the ultimate take down another pick. Baron's still fairly healthy, so the risk is here, but of course no smite available barring Xiang. I mean the vein damage is pretty nuts as well, so level should be able to take it or Uzi going in. That's maybe too deep. Forced to use the ulti to get away, but that gives that moves them off Baron here. Uzi, a little suicidal, but actually might have saved the Baron. Now remember, two level advantage for this top lane. As Jiang hasn't always had the best engages, he's Goes made in. it in. That's too early. Very good bait by QG. Jiang trying to find it. Uzi wants to go in as well. He's actually taken quite a bit of damage, but it's not nearly enough. And Swift will secure the Baron for his team. Uzi going in, gets the first kill. Ulti there onto TNT by Nautilus might be in as well, but TCT chasing him in cool. Finds his way back in. Uzi cuts back for another kill and Baron goes down. But OMG got four kills. What an insane fight coming through from QG. Swift gets the hell out of dodge, but no one else manages to. So Baron is now negated on four out of five members. Worth you would type in chat, given how dire the situation was for OMG. Only Uzi and Jiang fall. Great delay tactics. QG were looking very smart delaying the Baron, but it delayed their own demise. And Jiang... 
Got a frozen heart up now, so gonna be an even tank here. Hasn't quite found room or money for the Trinity Force, unfortunately, but we'll get there eventually. Hecarim does need to power up really to that two or three item spot, it feels like, but he just hit the W after driving into that Baron and lived for so much longer than QG thought he would. Understandably, given his lack of familiarity with the role, going more for the tanky build, not relying on himself to be the solo uh, kill threat with the Trinity Force. So the Trinity Force is either not going to come or going to be much later. Maybe just a Spirit Visage going to be the next pickup. This is fine. A lot of the Korean Hecarims move away from the Trinity Force just because the risk reward sometimes is off. If you don't get the burst damage on the priority member, you spent 3,700 gold on not very much. So it's not a bad yeah. purchase coming through. And we're just waiting to see the items. It looks like more damage. Bloodthirster seems to be the next pickup for TNT. Yeah, it's sort of like Baby's first hack room. It's just a much easier way to shut down the vein. Frozen Heart is not quite bursting someone down with a Trinity Force, but it's going to do a lot of work, and you don't have to do that much work. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of CC in his kit. A lot of the champions that build Frozen Heart have CC that they're getting on shorter cooldowns. The 40% CDR makes them a bit more survivable. Oh, the 20% from the item, but you're know, moving towards 40% makes it more survivable because, of course, the Spirit of Dread spell vamp is available more often. The helicopter Hecarim will happen, of course, because the Q's already on a very, very short cooldown. He's bought the Phage, though, so he's going to throw us to the ringer. It looks like Trinity Force will come eventually. He's just going through the insurance of the Frozen Heart. Yep, Dragon, though, will go to QG very quickly there as well. Too much damage there from TNT and a good smite from Swift. Keeps that in favor of QG for now and Giant Spell building up for Swift. Cal in there as well. Vayne also, maybe a Bloodthirster coming through for the next item by the looks of things and QG on the offensive once more. I don't mind the double lifesteal choice. You don't really, the Infinity Edge often feels like a bridge too far. You don't really find a slot for that item as Vayne. You're all more about staying alive during team fights and then just from the Silver Bolts and attack speed doing enough damage. So Bloodthirster is a third choice. You look down, Okay, it's not ideal choice against the Hecarim, but against everyone else, the Lifesteal is probably going to be the premium choice. I mean, just the shield against Cool especially. There's so many threats that are trying to dive you that I think it, it's a very smart choice here. Because if you ever survive, like you said, they're going and Cool going to get blown up there by Swift once again. And they'll just dive straight in. Amazing. Goes down next to VT and T and Swift. They're right in onto Uzi. That's the double there for Sejuani. And Swift again on this Sejuani. Amazing play. Absolutely and amazing. And the crazy thing is that Swift is a better go button than on the hunt, you'd have to say. They pop everything. It's often Flash Arctic Assault. As you can see, his Flash is down just to line up the perfect Glacial Prison. But oh so much advantage to get out of it. Zhang has got the Teleport. He's got the Smite. He's even got the Onslaught of Shadows. But there's nothing he can do. No, he can't. Inhibitor goes down there in the mid side. QG find themselves up. 5,000 gold now. 5-3 to three up in turrets. 2-1 to one up in Dragons there as well. And look at that gold. It's so even still between Uzi and TNT, but Uzi must be one at the end of this game. He'll check those stats and be like, how did this happen? Even with a 4,500 gold lead, I believe 1,500 is the gold lead for Jiang in a match where they're losing. So he's the one that has to carry potential. Being complete non-factor, that fight makes sense. LeBlanc, I believe a second or third time, was instantly exploded from the CC train coming through from Swift. It's all about the Arctic Assault into Wild Growth combo that's just been dying during the one one and a half, two second CC that comes through there. And it empowers TNT to just go crazy on the Vayne once the LeBlanc's dead. Because honestly, what other threats are there? I mean, much like Siva, Vayne is best when moving forward with her front line because she's fairly short range. You just want to keep going forward and try and kill people. And you're right, TNT's been set up perfectly to succeed by his team. And doesn't have to do too much work, but he's doing the work he needs to do. Five, one, and eight. 13 out of 15 kill participation. Happy to throw the wild growth, the whimsy onto the Sejuani, and she'll do the rest with a massive stack of health and resist. Very, very powerful at this point. Every Glacial Prison has been picture perfect. And look, we wondered, Swift, not an aggressive champion. It's not Lee Sing, which he hasn't played in quite a while. Not the Nidalee, not the Rexa that we've seen from him. How would he do on the Sejuani? Well, I guess he answered the question pretty damn well. And look, they're still within touching distance of a victory, but they looked good in the first 10 minutes and then fell away. It's almost a reverse in this situation. They're the ones making the triumphant comeback, so it's good to know that this young squad is still able of playing League of Legends when they're, on the, when they're behind rather than just when they're ahead, because some teams, of course, better at playing from ahead than they are from behind. It's mostly been off the back of Swift. It's definitely no guaranteed victory just yet, as the Siva Hecarim comp has so often come up trumps for both OMG and multiple teams in the LPL, but if they can recreate one more of those picture-perfect engages, they should take this game. They should indeed, and TNT looking very confident, sitting with the rest of his team, just going to ride the minion wave up to the next turret, 
Little hard for them to see it here. I like that Malka is up in a side lane there with his teleport ready, just trying to cause havoc. But poke there from Doinby is going to come through. TNT will keep cleaning the waves, and Swift, if they ever try and dive in, he'll just chuck out the ulti. Surprised not to see them five man group. You feel like if the burst comes into one of their members during the channel from V, that might be enough for OMG to get back into this game. Honestly, they really want to see some big bursts coming out from Cool, but perhaps he doesn't have the items to do it. Pastry time. Again, another super defensive LeBlanc build. It makes me wonder why people consider picking this champion if they're going to go as defensive as possible, only with the outside hope of getting any sort of burst. I mean, I don't mind the Void stuff second. You could have brought it up already, but I agree with this. I see with Abyssal Scepter coming through, and Swift going to dive in, finds the opening onto Uzi. He'll go down there. TNT gets the turret and the kill there. Now it's Quake are going to go down as well. Will fall there as Vayne gets a double TNT. Can he give in another pentakill? Cool. Going to be the next target. Will dive back in. Looking for it. Tries to find it. Doesn't quite get it. Amazing. Going to get chased down as well. He wanted the second, but he's not going to get it. Instead, he might just get the win. Well, I mean, uh, not getting a second pentakill. You know, my monocle is falling out of my eyes. Pastry time. Can't be that easy in life sometime. He's going to have to look to his teammates to thank, though. LeBlanc falls down as well, and Jiang is on a one-man mission. goes in there, TNT again. How many kills does he have? He's going to get another one, it looks like. That's not the Quadra, unfortunately, but it might as well be unofficial. Looks like QG might have done it, and Swift in a league with Kakao, Spirit, and Clearlove. Looks incredible on this Sejuani OMG. They'll try and defend as best they can, but TNT will cut around. Nunu's going to go down. Uzi Zither. really wants it, but he's not going to get it done, and TNT will get a double to end his game and what a win to force the split. QG looked very impressive during the first 10 minutes of game one and then the comeback after the first 10 minutes of this particular game, Swift in particular. He picked up that kill on top and said, okay, maybe not ideal kill distribution, but still Sejuani with extra gold is not often a bad thing. And man, did he make it work with just multiple picks under priority targets. Twice in a row it was the LeBlanc. The last time it was Uzi of all people. And from there, QG did the rest. It's good to see Uzi smiling, being a good sport there, despite the fact that his Sivir just got beaten by Vayne, which I'm sure stings a little as a, a Vayne being his favorite champion. But QG, a well-deserved win there. Not the 2-0 that they may have wanted to continue what would look like an incredible start to their LPL season, but 3-1 for the weekend against LGD and OMG. That's quite the record. Now, QG will be in touching distance of whoever is at the top. Edward Gaming do have the opportunity to open up a two-point lead at the top if they win the last game of tonight. But Master 3 and QG, four points out of six is pretty much business done perfectly in the first week. You can't win them all unless you're Edward Gaming yeah, potentially. But it's still a really good start for this promoted team. Came in with a lot of hype and definitely performing thus far better than the King lineup managed to with similar hype in split one. And if I've learned anything from just the, the whole weekend of QG's games. Siv is good. Swift's really good. Swift is. Siv, Siv is also very good. That definitely this week has taught us that. We've still got two more matches to go, don't forget, but Swift is really, really good. Rek'Sai, Sedwani, he does it all. And are you just excited for the storylines? We've seen him against TBQ and now the new jungler for OMG. Not that exciting, but some of the matchups are mouthwatering. Kakao, Dandy, Clear Love. Oh, Dandy's in this league too. I forgot all, about that. All those Korean junglers, I mean, Clear Love as yeah, well, are pretty too. damn good. So there's many exciting jungle matchups to be had. And who will be the strongest jungler in the LPL summer? It was already an exciting question in the spring. Add Swift to the lineup, another world-class jungler. And it's a jungler's paradise. It is indeed. It's only gotten better, and so will the rest of our matches. We have two more this evening, so don't go too far away as RNG are playing LGD Nick.